creates questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. The Extraordinary is the bewildering phenomena of spontaneous combustion cases from around the world where people have simply burst into flames. It was as if I stepped into Dante's Inferno. What I was looking at was impossible as far as I was concerned, but I had to accept the facts as I saw them. And I was looking at a pile of ashes on a living room carpet in a small enclosed council house. And those ashes were the remains of a man all that was left apart from that was the unburnt feet and the blackened skull. It is the spiritual connection actress Anne Margaret says she still has with the late Elvis Presley, 17 years after his death. We moved so much alike. We would harmonize all the time, have, to have, have fun. When we started rehearsing some of the dances, He'd look at me, he says, I don't believe this. So many things were the same. It is the unidentified flying object that followed this family for four hours. A strange, bright light in the sky. I was just terrified, literally petrified. I thought, I honestly thought, this is it, this thing's gonna land. And it seemed to be sort of darting around everywhere, coming in closer, going out a bit. Then it came over the top of us as we were driving. Was it a planet, as one expert suggests? If you look at a bright light in the night sky long enough, uh, your own eye starts to move, and it creates a sort of false impression of movement. Or was it something else? It wasn't a helicopter, because a helicopter wouldn't stay stationary for so long. And it wasn't an aeroplane, it had no flashing lights. But UFO researchers have no doubt about this sighting. They say it's one of the most compelling ever recorded. Like a big bell, a heavy, dark, very dark object, a bell. And um, what we're looking at, suddenly it wasn't as if there was one object, there was maybe two or three objects. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight, on the Extraordinary. More on that remarkable story later. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. There have been reports of spontaneous human combustion for decades. It is a phenomenon that the medical world cannot explain, and one that leaves the rest of us bewildered and more than a little scared. It's an event that takes place without warning, where people suddenly burst into flames and die. If it weren't for the photographic evidence of so many cases, it would be easily dismissed as a figment of the imagination. The most recent example is this amazing story from Alison Holloway in London. Orange-coloured heat that enveloped him first. A sticky, choking humidity that wrapped around the policeman and everything else in the room where Henry Thomas had died. Outside, in the rolling hills near the village of Ebervale, the Wales countryside was chilled by winter in January. But in here, the hot air clawed at his lungs. I opened the door and stepped in, and it was as if I stepped into Dante's Inferno. As if, that's what struck me immediately I entered the room. There was this hellish sort of orangey red glow and the room was literally steaming. It was humid. The heat was radiating from the walls and it was very dark apart from this reddish glow. The policeman was John Hamer, a special crime scene officer with the Gwent Constabulary. And he'd been called to the house of a local resident, Henry Thomas, after a report of a house on fire. 
I've been a policeman for 24 years, and uh, for the last few years I was a scenes of crime officer, which meant that I attended every serious crime, death, suicide, whatever. And I photographed the scene, looked for fingerprints and forensic evidence, which was then passed on to the forensic scientist to examine. So I'd seen quite a lot of horrible deaths, you know, pilots burned to death in light aircraft crashes and bodies been in rivers for months, whatever. And uh, you get used to this thing, and I was pretty hardened. But nothing had prepared Hamer for what he saw in this room. 73-year-old Henry Thomas had turned to ashes, burned to a crisp from the inside out, like 200 other recorded cases. It's called spontaneous human combustion, in police lingo, human candles. Charles Dickens, in his book, Bleak House, had described the exact scene John Hamer witnessed this day. There is a suffocating vapor in the room. The burning smell is there, and the soot is there, and he is not there. Reports of spontaneous human combustion date back to the 1600s, and its eerie descriptions allow for none of the usual police or scientific explanations. As in the case of Henry Thomas, the coroner's reports usually find that the victim died by accidental fire, like smoking in bed or falling into a fireplace. But the dozens of photos of death scenes seem to tell another story. In all cases, the body seemed to burn up from within, leaving only parts of the limb extremities intact. Despite the intense heat needed to consume human bone and flesh, there is little about the body that is burned, even flammable clothing and carpet. In the case of Henry Thomas, police officer John Hamer came upon a scene that felt like the fires of hell had swept through the room, but burned only its human contents. There was a television set just inside the door, still on, the valves were glowing, although no picture on the screen, and the plastic knobs had melted out of shape. It looked like something painted by Salvador Dali. And looking to the right, I saw a pile of ashes and protruding it from the end of the ashes was a pair of human feet clothed in socks and with just a lower few inches of trouser legs attached to them. I just couldn't believe it. It took me a few minutes to realise what I was actually looking at. What I was looking at was impossible as far as I was concerned, but I had to accept the facts as I saw them. And I was looking at a pile of ashes on the living room carpet in a small enclosed council house and those ashes were the remains of a man. All that was left apart from that was the unburnt feet and the blackened skull. Since Thomas's death and the publicity that followed, Officer Hamer has tracked down, or been told about, at least five other human candles in Britain. All of those five cases, four of them, the verdict was death by burning, and one of them, a tramp in London who was discovered, face down on the first floor landing of a derelict building, the fireman broke in and found him with blue flames issuing up force from his abdomen. He was burning the landing, not the other way around. Jenny Randalls, who co-authored the book Spontaneous Human Combustion, among other paranormal subjects, says the scientific world has been stumped by the evidence of such cases. All the time we're trying to find a rational explanation for what is going on. And that is the great challenge of spontaneous human combustion. Clearly there's something happening because the cases, the evidence, the photographs of these people in these conditions prove that beyond any reasonable doubt. It's an extraordinary thing because the human body, of course, is basically two-thirds water and very solid skeletal bone structure, which is effectively indestructible. We've talked to people in crematoriums who specialise, of course, in destroying a human body by fire. And they cannot make bones turn into ash, which is what happens in spontaneous combustion. That's the most extraordinary part of it. And that seems to be beyond the capabilities of uh, even our best machines that generate intense heat. Randalls, who wrote the book with colleague Peter Huff, said she became involved after they were brought in to investigate the strange death of a college student. Nothing. They didn't mind at all. In fact, he bought me this ring. He bought me this ring. That's gorgeous. That awesome? A teenage girl was walking down the stairs at college, happily chatting to her friends in the middle of the morning, when, out of nowhere, she burst into flames. Oh, my God. What is going on? What? 
Testimony from some of the witnesses talked about a strange spark suddenly appearing in midair and falling towards the girl who then burst into flames. Uh, they managed to put the flames out. She was taken to hospital, but tragically she died from her injuries. But Randall says the strangest case of human combustion she ever investigated was the burning of Mary Reza. Suddenly, sitting in her favorite armchair with two fans blowing, she apparently burst into flames. That story in a moment. Of all the cases of spontaneous human combustion investigated by Jenny Randalls, co-author of the book, Spontaneous Human Combustion, none was quite so mystifying as the death of a woman named Mary Reza. Mary was a socialite and perhaps the most important woman in the town of Columbia, Pennsylvania. But after her husband's death, she moved to Florida. Well, Mom, welcome to Florida. Oh, great to have you home, I tell you. It's great here. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. I tell you, I it's been too long. It was in her Florida apartment late on the night of July the 2nd, 1951, as she sat alone, depressed and homesick for Columbia, that she literally went up in smoke. Her son, Dr. Richard Reza, now 84, remembers visiting her only hours before her death. The night before, the last I saw her, I went, drove down to say goodnight to her. We were about nine o'clock, and my youngest daughter was with me, Marty, who was about four years old then. And she was sitting in her overstuffed chair. The bedclothes had been turned down, bedsheet. And uh, the fan was blowing, he had a fan. And uh, she seemed uh, perfectly uh, at ease. After Dr. Reason left his mother that night, something happened in Mary Reeser's little apartment at 1200 Cherry Street in St. Petersburg, Florida. Nobody will ever know exactly why it happened. But when firefighters broke through the door the next morning, Mary at first seemed to be missing. The air in the room was a thick, grey haze. The carpet beneath their feet had a sinister and somewhat nauseating stickiness. The ceiling and one of the walls were black with soot, but had not been burned. A body-sized patch of carpeting had been scorched down to the cement floor. And in the centre of the exposed cement, a modest pile of black ashes. The last remains of Mary Reza. Clues to Mary's death were scant, but a neighbor reported waking up and smelling smoke at about 5 a.m. When she retrieved her morning paper at nine o'clock, the smell had gone. It was about 8 a.m. that a Western Union delivery boy came with a telegram from friends back in Colombia saying they had found her a long-awaited apartment back in her hometown. She had wanted to return to Colombia for the summer and stay with friends and renew old acquaintances. And it's, it's uh, strange, very strange, that uh, this whole episode was found uh, by a telegram boy knocking on the door or uh, the morning she was found with a telegram stating that from her friend in Columbia that uh, she was to come up there. Very strange. The delivery boy said when he tried the doorknob of Mary's apartment, it was too hot to touch, an indication of some intense heat being generated from inside. The investigation found that Mary had perished sometime between dawn and 9 a.m. 
the media of the day went crazy with the story. And though the official cause of death was accidental burning, possibly from a cigarette, there are many who are convinced the spark that consumed Mary Reza came from something within. Margaret has been one of the most popular Hollywood celebrities for many years now. She's starred with Jack Nicholson, Elvis Presley, and a long list of Hollywood's most famous. Her success, she says, is determined by a very special ritual taught to her by her mother a long time ago. In the beginning, Anne Margaret seemed too beautiful for Hollywood. She was a Swedish bombshell, too sweet to be true and too good to be real. Behind the public sex kitten was a shy, private young woman with old-fashioned values. I believe in dignity, I believe in honour, I believe in... Uh... When someone's in trouble, help them. If someone's speaking ill of someone, I get right in there, because I won't allow it. The gossip columns painted her as some sort of tragic heroine, mixed up and self-destructive, and under the control of guru husband, one-time actor Roger Smith. Through it all, she starred in Bye Bye Birdie, played opposite Elvis Presley in Viva Las Vegas, Jack Nicholson in Carnal Knowledge, and Roger Daltrey in the movie Tommy. When we talked to Anne Margaret recently, she recalled the reports of her recovery from alcohol abuse and the accident that suddenly brought her down to earth. Rehearsing in Las Vegas in 1972, she fell almost eight metres from a stage scaffolding, nearly ending her life and career. Anything but love, baby. She recorded the ups and downs of her life in her recent book, My Story. Baby, dream of I was spared any fear because it happened so fast. The 22 feet, all I remember, and I, I was in a... There was a bar here, too. But it, it just whipped over just like that. It was a near-fatal incident that was complicated further by her husband Roger's battle with a disease called myasthenia gravis. Suddenly, Anne Margaret had to take control of two lives. Ever since I was a little girl, I was told, God will never give you more than you can handle. She grew up in a small Swedish town and learned the rules long ago forgotten in Hollywood. Swedish Stoicism. I learned that, I think, before I was born. <laughs> um, one doesn't, this is a crazy industry for me to be in because one doesn't talk about oneself. If you fall down, you don't cry. Uh, you don't ever complain. You don't talk back. And she brought with her a special kind of Swedish superstition. The thing that I get really crazy, ever since I was four years old, if I was going to do like a reading or a, sing a little song or something, and all through, if my mother did not give me three Swedish good luck kicks, every time she's in the audience when I'm performing, all of a sudden I'll remember, Oh my goodness, Alan, do you think you can get mom out of the audience? I, she didn't give me my, my Swedish good luck kicks. And then when she does it, she, oh, poor mother, she just... She does the Swedish good luck kicks right on my seat. And then everything's fine, I calm down. And now she has given the authority, if she can't be there, to my husband to do it. 
her superstitions came into play the first and only performance her husband ever missed. She didn't get her three kicks. That was the only time that Roger had left my side. He'd always saw all of my shows. But Tracy, the oldest, was going to a new school. And we both thought, you know, that he should be there. I had to work, you know, because it's scary going to a new school. Wouldn't you know, that's what had happened. If fate dealt her a blow that day, it gave her a gift in her connection with the late Elvis Presley. We had a terrific relationship. Uh, it was interesting. We, we met at MGM at a rehearsal. And I was going to do this Viva Las Vegas with him. I had never met him before, and I had never seen him perform before, because I was so studious. I was always doing homework, and I'd, I'd seen a picture of him, but I'd never seen him move. And I don't know what everybody thought was going to happen when we first met. <laughs> thought that maybe we'd break into song and go, you know. He was just as shy as I was, and when he said something to me, I'd look down. <laughs> and then when I said something to him that was sweet, he'd sort of look down. Oh, it was just so funny. And then when we started rehearsing some of the dances, he'd look at me. He says, I don't believe this. We moved so much alike. We would harmonize all the time, have, have, have fun. We, we were together, we saw each other for about a year. Uh, we were the only, both only children. We respected our parents greatly. Always stood up when an older person walked into a room. Manners. So many things were the same. But the first man in Anne Margaret's life was her father. When she came from Sweden at age six, he took her to Radio City Music Hall to see her first show. After his death, Radio City asked her to perform her act. Coincidentally, opening night was her father's birthday. I said, Roger, when am I supposed to open? October 22nd. That's daddy's birthday. Did you know that? He says, you're kidding. I did it. I did it. Because I knew he was watching, boy. And Mom was like in the, um, the second row there, right in the middle. And uh, I explained my life and everything. I did some speech and stuff. And uh, boy, I, I knew Daddy was watching and listening to make sure that uh, the chip off the old block did, did the right thing. It was like I was performing for, for my father, mother, and my husband. It was very, very spiritual, because he, he was always with me. Of course, God's always with me. Right in here, right in here. And Roger is always with her a 30-year love affair through ups and downs. Life is more peaceful now. What's the most important thing in life? Love. In the early 1990s, a strange thing happened on the densely populated eastern coast of Australia. A couple were travelling by car north of Sydney. They'd done the journey many times before. But on this night, something unexplained happened. Susan and Vardik say they were followed for four hours by a UFO. Bright lights, alien shapes in the sky, eerie phenomena and unexplained events. They're all part of the mystery of UFOs, unidentified flying objects. At the time it was, wow, what a buzz. 
But then as, the, as we sort of started to think about what had happened, we, you know, we thought this could have actually been quite a nasty experience. To the researchers, some UFOs are just that, unidentified. Others can be explained logically and scientifically. But to the people who actually see them, UFOs can be a terrifying experience. I was just terrified, literally petrified. I thought, I honestly thought this is it, this thing's going to land. Let's begin with Susan and Vardik Kudrin. It's July 1993, early in the morning, around 3am. They've been driving along the Hume Highway for about an hour. Their destination is Sydney, and they've just passed through Albury-Wodonga on the Victorian-New South Wales border. Then, Susan noticed a piercingly bright light in the sky. A light she thought was following them. Susan had her new video camera with her and began taping the object. She would continue to do so for the next three hours. We just kept driving and I started getting pretty um, petrified about the whole thing. And it seemed to be sort of darting around everywhere, coming in closer, going out a bit. Then it came over the top of us as we were driving. This is the tape Susan shot early that winter's morning on that lonely stretch of highway. She says that through the camera's viewfinder, the object seemed to be bat-shaped. It seemed to be darting across the sky. And she was convinced it had them in its sights. As the light hovered directly over the Kudrin's car, they knew it was no ordinary aircraft. Our engine started dying on the car and we dropped about 40 kilometres an hour. Dropped down to about 65, 70 k's. And um, that's when I started panicking. So I was thinking, oh no, um, it's going to come and get us. He was extremely nervous. Uh, when he gets nervous, he goes very, very quiet and very calm and he says, don't worry about it, it's nothing to panic about, we'll be in Gandagai shortly. Several times Vardik put his foot down. Several times nothing happened. No response from the engine. Then suddenly the car accelerated. Everything was back to normal, except for one thing. That bright light was still there. And it stayed with them as they drove on right into the town of Gundagai, where they stopped to buy food. I found it again on top of the hill, and I said to Vardik, it's still there. Um, it's just like it was waiting up on top of the hill for us to finish. But it was extremely bright. It was um, a lot better, even filming it, a lot better picture of it sitting up there. It was just there, just sitting on top of the hill, just waiting or watching, I don't know. Susan and Vardik say they were nervous, embarrassed, so they didn't mention the light to anyone in Gundagai. They set out again on their journey towards Sydney, and for two hours, the mysterious light kept pace with them, and Susan taped it. As dawn broke, it was still there, still shining in the sky. And it was at that time that the thing started to um turn around it was almost like it was folding back on itself so that we could see the back of it uh, like a tailish sort of um, figure and fan-like in its appearance and it darted around and did all these sorts of things with the uh, back towards us and then would zoom off and then would come back again do the same thing again zoom off and come back again and by that time I was sort of really wow this is really incredible and more interested in the fact that we we're probably experiencing something that um, not many people get to see. We could see it in broad daylight near the end. You could see the sun coming up. All the other stars have gone and there's still this one bright object in the sky and it just disappeared. It just vanished. Their travelling companion was gone, but the Kudrins would not forget their strange encounter. First, there was the tape, proof to them that they hadn't imagined the whole thing. When we got back and looked at the tape, it was, I was astounded at what sort of tape. I just, I couldn't believe my eyes. I just didn't think there was anything like that out there. All I could see was the bright light 
and it was just fascinating to watch the tape that Susan had taped and what she had seen. And now I know why she was so amazed and excited about what she was taping. Then, about nine months later, there was to be a second sighting, just as clear as the first. It would absolutely convince the Kudrins that they had been allowed a rare and wonderful glimpse of the unknown. Susan comes home from work and says, it's out there again. And I said, oh no, is it? She goes, yeah, it is, get the video camera out. And I said, the battery wasn't charged. So um, I put the battery on charge for about half an hour just to get enough power in it so we can view it again. This time, Vardik taped the object. It was identical to the one he'd seen on the original video. Bat-shaped, pulsating, and moving across the sky. I went through the same emotions again. Um, I was scared, what's it doing back? And then, what's it doing? I sort of wanted to know, what's it after? And then it disappeared again, and I still don't know what it's doing. It wasn't a helicopter, because a helicopter wouldn't stay stationary for so long. And it wasn't an aeroplane, it had no flashing lights. So it could only boil down to one thing, which was a UFO. Well, was it a UFO? In a moment, we'll put the Kudrin video to the test and investigate another sighting. This one, filmed in broad daylight. <laughs> Sightings occur around the world. Many are discounted, but the people directly involved swear that they saw something unexplained. Then, there are those cases caught on film or videotape, cases that even the experts find hard to explain. A bright light that followed a Victorian couple for three hours as they drove through the Australian bush. A light they're convinced was a UFO. A bat-shaped object that darted across the sky. One they're sure had an unearthly influence on the engine of their car. In an attempt to identify the unidentified, we consulted international UFO researcher Bill Chalker. We showed him the video taken by Susan Kudrin in July 1993, and the interviews we'd recorded with Susan and her husband. After studying the tapes, Bill Chalker first tried to determine why the object seemed to be shaped like a bat. The camera itself is gone to total zoom or to infinity and gone beyond really the limitations of the camera lens system itself and so you've got a, an out of focus image and um, also the, the internal geometry of the camera showing up so you have this sort of curious bat shape which has nothing whatsoever to do with the actual shape of the object itself. As for the effect the hovering object appeared to have on the engine of the Kudrin's car, the best Bill Chalker could do was put that down to coincidence and the fact that the vehicle was second-hand. Then, there was Susan and Vardik's conviction that the light, on more than one occasion, dashed across the sky. Bill Chalker concluded that was camera movement. But remember, the Kudrins not only taped the moving object, they say they saw it clearly with their own eyes. If you look at a bright light in the night sky long enough, um, your own eye starts to move and it creates a sort of a false impression of movement. Finally, Bill Chalker went to his computer in an attempt to track down the mysterious object. He plotted the date, the time and the location of the sighting. The position of Venus at that time was coincident with, with, with the general direction that they were filming in. There's also a section of the video that shows it um, more or less uh, with uh, the dawn arriving and, uh, and that's the clearest sort of impression that you get that it is Venus that you're actually videoing there. There's little doubt at that point that uh, they're still filming Venus and to them uh, it was still the same object that they're looking at. So according to the expert what the Kudrin saw and taped was apparently the planet Venus. That's not to say that there aren't 
legitimate uh, videos and films out there, we've investigated over the years uh, a number of cases where, despite uh, extensive investigation, these films have remained unexplained and, and the, the events themselves remain un unexplained. And that's certainly the case with this remarkable sighting. A sighting that after almost 20 years remains a mystery even to the experts. It began as thousands of Australians were preparing to view one of the solar system's great spectacles, an eclipse of the sun. Among them, Nick Flaskus. Being a, a keen amateur astronomer for many years, this was an opportunity in order to see some, a very rare event. So early on the morning of October the 23rd, 1976, Nick set out with his best friend, Frank Samaras, and Frank's younger brother, Billy. They were bound for Ben Boyd National Park, near Eden on the New South Wales south coast. It was the perfect place to study and film the eclipse. We had two cameras. We had a Super 8 uh, camera, which had never been used before. This was the very first time that Frank was using this film and camera. And we had a 35 millimeter standard uh, camera as well. They may have been amateurs, but they were well prepared. Frank had bought special night film for his new movie camera. Film that would be able to cope with the dramatic changes in light as the sun disappeared. Nick and Frank set up their equipment and explained once more to Billy that he'd damage his eyes if he looked directly at the sun during the eclipse. Basically, because I couldn't look at the eclipse, and uh, what I did was I turned around and looked out over the ocean, and as I looked out over the ocean, I saw the, uh, the these cloud cigar-shaped uh, figures. So we looked at them and thought, well, that's interesting. There was a kind of like a big bell, a heavy dark, very dark object, a bell. And um, while we're looking at it, suddenly it wasn't as if there was one object, there was maybe two or three objects. For a moment, the boys were stunned. Behind them, their cameras were set to film the eclipse. But in front of them, out over the ocean, there was something else. Something far more fascinating. Mysterious objects that had captured their imagination. At that point, Nicholas and I said, yeah, let's go. So we turned the cameras around, and I said to Nick, I will never focus back on the sun again. He said, oh, it doesn't matter because this is more important. First, they tried Nick's 35mm stills camera, but it was useless. So they concentrated on the Super 8. They were sure that with its zoom lens, they'd have more chance of success. And as he's filming it and zooming in the lens towards it, there weren't two or three, there were something like six of these objects, one main one and five smaller ones. Because it was the first time I'd ever used it, I panned, and as you'll see from the film, I was panning the horizon. So instead of concentrating on an object, that panning, there's a little bit of a distortion there. So you've really got to look for, for the UFO when you actually see the film. The film is very grainy, and Frank's panning motion doesn't help the casual viewer to get a fix on the object. But when we zoom in electronically, it does become a little more distinct. To the naked eye, it may just seem like a blur, but as you'll see in a moment, it was enough to give the experts a clear picture of the shapes the boys filmed back in 1976. It was like a, a, a bell. The main object was like a bell. As they filmed, the boys were spellbound. But then they remembered the purpose of their expedition. They had only three minutes of Super 8 film and the eclipse was well underway. It was a wonderful experience looking at, you know, at the eclipse. As the eclipse ended, we turned around again to look at the, um, the, what we saw, the, the, the objects. They weren't in the sky. We stayed there for about half an hour and nothing happened. When the boys got their film back from the lab, naturally, they were disappointed. What seemed so clear through the viewfinder looked so murky on celluloid. But even now, almost 20 years later, they have no doubt what they saw that day. 
a dark grey um, bell shaped, a dome shaped type object just sort of sitting on the horizon. It was, there were no bright lights, there were no colours. You could see them actually rotating and at one stage while we were filming you could actually see them moving closer backwards and forward. Since that day in 1976, many experts have studied this snippet of 8mm film and eventually it was sent to America for evaluation. Investigators with the organisation called Ground Saucer Watch fed all the material into their computers. The grainy film was enhanced and it was inspected and analysed frame by frame. The results of that analysis came as no surprise to Nick, Frank and Billy. It merely confirmed what they'd seen in Ben Boyd National Park. The experts concluded that the object was a vast distance from the camera. It was a dull grey colour. It was similar to a bell or dome in its configuration. It was definitely not a helicopter or conventional aircraft. It was in fact, an object of unknown origin, a true UFO. International actor Roger Moore knows what it is like to die. To this day, he swears he once left his body and found himself looking down on the scene he was playing with Lana Turner. I have to hold my breath. I hold my breath. And the director, <laughs> the director David Venner, got Ave Maria playing. <laughs> and I swear I left my body. And I went up above stage 12, and I was right above all the sound stages at MGM. And I was up there in the clouds looking down. Roger Moore, an untold story next time. Roger Moore and a story not to be missed. Now, if you have a story you'd like us to investigate, write to Post Office Box 462, Newport Beach, Sydney, Australia, 2106. Before we go, a look at another story from next week. It's about an unwanted ghost. She roams the halls of an historic home in the city of Adelaide. For now, good night. See you in the future. The lights just came on by themselves and it was like chandeliers. All the light globes exploded and two paintings just came flying off the wall. <laughs> <laughs>